second team uh, from the Airpod Challenge. And the difference between first and the second place was very, very low. So it is nice to hear the, the story of the, the team from Cyber how, how they did it in the competition. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, hello everyone. I'm uh, Navin the Code uh, I was the uh, PI for the Team Saro Data Sixty One at the Data Supply Challenge, and I'm also the group leader for CSRO's Robotics and Autonomous Systems Group, um, based in Brisbane. Uh, a quick overview of our organization for those who are not familiar. So uh, CSRO or CSRO as we call it uh, stands for Commonwealth uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. And we are Australia's national science agency with a history of over 100 years. And um, we have many sites um, all around Australia, but also have a few overseas locations as well. Uh, so the great thing about going after Tim and, and, and Lawrence uh, is that I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining what the DAPA Subkey Challenge is. So I'll, I'll um, jump straight on to onto uh, our team and what, what we did. So um, after three years of competition in multiple circuit events, uh, we were one of the eight finalists that participated in the um, grand final that was held last year. And our team consisted of um, Cyro as the prime, and then we had two partners. Um, one was Emerson, a Brisbane-based drone autonomy company that spun out from our lab a few years ago. And then the other partner was Georgia Tech uh, based in Atlanta. So Emerson provided the drone autonomy and Georgia Tech provided uh, multi-agent coordination. Uh, Cyro provided ground robots, SLAM capability, communications, navigation, exploration, and object detection and localization capabilities. Uh, so this slide um, um, gives a closer look and, uh, at, the, at the actual platforms that we deployed in the, in the final event. So we had um, two Boston Dynamic Spot quadrupeds, and we had two um, track robots, or we call them the ATRs or the all-terrain robots. And the, these are built uh, by a Brisbane-based company. And then we also had um, drones, uh, UAVs uh, from Emerson. Uh, so overall, we deployed two of each. So our fleet had six agents, so two, uh, two quadrupeds, two track robots, and two uh, two UAVs, and uh, we also had droppable comms nodes. Um, we see uh, down at the bottom right here, and uh, we could carry four of those uh, on the track robot, and they, they could be dropped uh, to form a mesh network. And in our case, uh, all of the robots, including the drones, were uh, mesh nodes. By dropping additional nodes, we could uh, we could attempt to have a, a wider coverage. And uh, this is an example of what uh, Tim mentioned earlier as, uh, as a marsupial deployment. And um, you'll see that in this, uh, in this video where the drone takes off from the back of the uh, track robot. And then you'll see a, a communication node being uh, ejected uh, or dropped from the, from the track robot. And after a delay, uh, it uh, writes itself, opens up the ground plane and, and um, extends the antennas. So um, given that we are based in Australia, uh, due to COVID-related risks, uh, we faced some additional um, challenges last year. So as a result, we couldn't send our core team to the US, including our engineering team. So we had to ship our robots and equipment over and we had to get our partners, Emerson, Georgia Tech and staff from the CSIRO US-based office um, to travel, travel to the event, along with a couple of our alumni from our lab that were based in the US. So uh, myself and our, and our team, uh, we remotely joined um, through telepresence robots uh, all the way from, from Brisbane. And uh, uh, you see some of those images in, in this slide uh, with our team working U US East Coast hours from Australia, uh, providing uh, remote engineering support uh, for, the, for the team. And uh, the, the bottom center one is, is uh, quite special as well. This is uh, one of the team members that were in the US having to perform uh, some electrical um, repairs to one of the uh, robots with, uh, with close guidance from our team based in Australia. 
So I will show you a video of our final price run and try to explain what happened along the way. I will also try my best to show different views of what happened during the run, uh, such as um, views from our communications connectivity, uh, one of the views from the uh, base station that the human supervisor uh, was, was looking at, and also some uh, footage from the, from the DARPA cameras that, that were made available to us later on. And uh, so this, uh, this slide shows some of the things that you'll see in those videos. So on the, on the left-hand frame, that would be our communications view showing each of the robots as a, as a red marker. Uh, and then we'll have these different colored lines connecting the robots. So green means a fairly good communication. Uh, as it tends towards red, that means the communication is very poor and hard to, um, any any data being transferred. And in some cases, you'll see the uh, links completely being dropped as well. And you'll also see uh, light green or teal uh, markers. So th those would be the communication nodes that, uh, that are being dropped. And uh, in those screens, you will also see the current score and the run, um, and the run clock and um, things like that. And on the right-hand right -hand side, uh, that's um, one of the views that the base station would have. And uh, this would show, again, the robots in uh, various colored markers. And then you'd have um, the artifacts that are detected and scored appearing as spheres in, in different colors. And again, you'd see the remaining time on the score. All right, so um, you'll, you'll see uh, robots being deployed into the course from, uh, from the top, uh, top left-hand side. Oh, and uh, what I forgot to mention was our, our robots had names, mainly the ground robots. So the two uh, legged robots were named uh, Bluey and Bingo. Uh, those who are from Australia or who are familiar with the ABC children's ca uh, cartoon show, they, they, they'll know the reference. And then uh, the two track robots were named uh, Bear and Rat. So in this case, we will first see um, Bluey getting into the course, uh, closely followed by Bingo. And then you'll soon see Bingo uh, uh, making quite a bit of progress, going very deep uh, into the course. But what happens is it, it loses communication connectivity. You'll see the connections turning red, and soon it, it'll, it'll completely disappear. So even though it had found the far reaches of the course, uh, happily exploring a, a cavern, uh, the human supervisor at the base station has no clue what the robot is doing. Uh, and now, now you'll see the base station view, and here it'll, it'll be a bit clearer where, um, uh, where when the robot drops out from the map, um, because if you don't have communication, you don't have a map either. Now, the, uh, the autonomy that we've programmed into these robots um, tells them uh, when to come back to the last known comms location based on time or, or, or the remaining battery life. Uh, but in, in this case, you see Bingo, uh, stopping here in that map, and soon you'll see text saying comms, uh, comms lost. There you go. So uh, as far as the um, human supervisor is concerned, it doesn't know that this is happening to Bingo uh, inside the course. So you'll see, see what happens to Bingo. So after encountering some really difficult terrain, unfortunately, it uh, falls down and it's, um, it's disabled, as in uh, cannot come back. It still has the really valuable data that it collected, but none of that is currently being sent back to the base station. And this is the other legged robot, Bluey, again, beyond comms range, uh, happily exploring uh, in, in fully autonomous mode. And uh, again, the human support is that does not know what, uh, what that robot is doing. So uh, something interesting happens here. Uh, it briefly makes connection to the fallen robot and then back to the base station. So immediately the human support gets a partial map of the far reaches of, that, um, of the course, uh, but only briefly. And again, back to the comms view. So you see here now Bluey and Bingo are connected. Uh, 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 so it's uh, Bluey's trying to mule the data back to the base station, even though it's still beyond comms range. So what unfortunately happens is, is uh, B, uh, Bluey also slips and falls uh, with the data that it had collected from Bingo as well, but still beyond comms range. So in this case, um, you, you'll see uh, one of our track robots have been uh, immobilized in the middle of the course as well due to one of the tracks coming off. 
So we only have uh, one mobile robot here, and that is uh, that is Bear, uh, which is one of the track robots. Uh, and the human supervisor is now trying to uh, send that robot as close as possible to the other robot because now he has some idea where which branch of the course that the disabled robots are. Uh, but given that it has a drone on the back, uh, uh, it can't fit through uh, that course. So it had to go back, go to a larger cavern, uh, launch the drone, and then uh, come back. So so it comes within communication range, which just um, just three minutes to spare on the clock. There, there you see the connectivity being made, and that's how we scored our um, last point with about twenty five seconds on the clock. So you uh, so this is what was happening at the at the base station. So the score is 22 at this time and the clock is counting down and the human voice is seeing the, the additional artifact reports coming back from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the far reaches of the course. And then as we hit around 25 seconds on the clock, you'll see the, the last, last point being scored. Yeah, so... Uh, so it was very, very nail biting. So it uh, came, came to the came to the last um, last few seconds. So he, here's a video sequence showing what uh, Bingo and Blue are up to deep inside the circuit. So this includes some GoPro footage that we uh, from the onboard cameras that we had. None of this, of course, was available to the uh, to the operators at this time. So this was after we got hold of the robot. And it also includes some footage from uh, DARPA cameras as well. So this is one of those uh, difficult parts of the course where it was fairly low overhang and had, um, over and over and uh, uh, kind of an arch on the, um, in the course, which some legged like robots deployed found difficult to traverse. So in our case, uh, it managed to successfully do that. So here it goes into that cavern and um, I'll, I'll pull it back just to show you something interesting. So uh, if you pay careful attention, you'll see that it's actually digging up a power cable that DARPA had carefully uh, Buried in the course, it almost trips on it. Luckily, it doesn't at that point. Uh, and then it goes to an area where it's literally raining inside, so you can see see water uh, dripping from the uh, from the ceiling. So extremely harsh, uh, uh, an extremely harsh environment, and you can see the uh, the rocks there. And very soon, you'll see it getting itself into some uh, some serious trouble uh, in those rocks. But it, it is actually absolutely remarkable how how much these legged robots um, have matured in capability over the last uh, last decade or so, uh, and uh, and the resilience and robustness of these robots have been uh, quite amazing. Uh, because what we've done is we've put our autonomy solution on top of the robot at the low level, uh, footstep planning and all of that is handled by by the robot system. So we 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 provide it with. Um, waypoints using our um, our autonomy system and all the all the rough terrain handling and uh, and all of that uh, is handled by the robot so something uh, that we did which we believe is unique uh, to our team is we did incorporate the onboard sensors of uh, the spot robots with our um, lidar based um, uh, slam map or the cost map that we were getting from that so we could uh, seamlessly plan from near to far uh, on, on the robot rather than uh, using them as uh, two two different systems. So that that's that's what we saw earlier, where the robot finally did uh, meet its end there. And uh, so this is this is blue wheel. With this sort of view, you get to appreciate the true beauty of the course that DARPA made. And soon uh, you'll see encountering uh, an interesting uh, obstacle. So that is water puddles, uh, water puddles filled with pebbles as well. Luckily for us, uh, our robots were able to 
successfully navigate these obstacles. that bright white light that you see is a fallen bingo. So that's when uh, Bluey sees, uh, sees its uh, fallen uh, fallen sibling in there. So, and, and then uh, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, so this is Bluey trying to come back home after collecting that valuable data. And it encounters another extremely challenging part of the course where you'd see the ground is hard, flat, uh, and wet, and slippery. And then you'll see what happens uh, in a little bit. So uh, now here, uh, this video gives you a glimpse of what the robot sees or, or the one of the representations of information that the robots uh, use to successfully navigate autonomously. And uh, you can see, uh, start playing this. So uh, you'll see what the robot is doing on the top left-hand corner and then the green rectangle is the footprint. Uh, this colored voxelized representation of an environment is the, the traversability cost map that we use. The colors represent the cost for traversing. Uh, so green is traversable, pink is fatal, uh, and the dark purple areas are what we call virtual surfaces. So these are areas where the sensors on the robot haven't seen yet, like um, negative obstacles or a ledge or a drop off. Our system hypothesizes what that unseen surface may look like. And as we get more information from the sensors, the hypothesis is updated. And you, uh, we will switch to another view here. This is our uh, cost to go tree. Uh, it is a graph-based representation of where the robot can go from where it is as it uh, travels to goal position. So these graph nodes and edges are colored by the travels of cost. And you will also see these colors changing as the robot moves and also when uh, it selects a new goal position to go to. And this is happening without any, any human intervention. All right, so um, after all of that, uh, we uh, tied for the top score and ended up in uh, second place after the tiebreaker rules were applied where uh, um, it, can, it was considered which team scored those points the fastest and we were a little bit behind um, you know, by about 40, 45 seconds or 46 seconds. Uh, so, but we, we were in great company in the leaderboard as you can see, uh, uh, apart from the two other teams that are presenting today, uh, uh, team Explorer um, was made up of CMU and Oregon State University co-star consisting of JPL, Caltech, and MIT. Uh, so in, in, in terms of um, the field robotics community, we, we were in very good company. And uh, given the logistical challenges that we had to face uh, to com compete in the finals, we were very happy with the result and we were extremely proud of the capability that we had developed over the uh, last few years and um, yeah and then we were really happy with the, with the overall system performance and as Tim mentioned we definitely did um, experience attrition uh, but uh, the, t uh, the system did exactly what it was designed for as, as, the, as there was attrition as system subsystem started failing the overall system still uh, was resilient to that, uh, was robust to that, uh, and managed to do what it was designed, that is to get the really valuable data back to the base, uh, back to the base station. So beyond the result of coming second in a very close finish, we, uh, we were also able to generate very accurate maps of the environment. Our uh, maps had less than 1% deviation from the survey ground truth 
as you can see here. So the so the uh, gray markers are the gray points are the uh, are the ground truth. And as you can see, apart from one small segment, we had good coverage uh, for for most most of the most of the course. And you can see the different colors are representing the robots which which covered those areas. So there's a, a point cloud fly through, uh, but I, I won't dwell on that. I'll, I'll move on. Um, so how did we achieve this outcome? So our main competitive advantage was um, the homogeneous sensing with heterogeneous platforms concept. So each of our ground robots, like a track, um, had the same sensing and autonomy payload, a spinning Velodyne LiDAR that we call our CAT pack. Um, Emerson's hover map on the drones um, with a different form factor, but had the same spinning Velodyne LiDAR, and they were all running uh, CSRO's Wildcat SLAM system, providing accurate mapping and localization. Uh, this slide shows the various different robots that we deployed over the past three years, not just uh, the ones that we deployed in the finals. Uh, showing that our sensing system can easily be adapted to various heterogeneous platforms. So each of the platforms have the same camera-based perception system using CSIRO's DNet object detection framework. Each of the ground platforms have the same autonomy payload running our multi-agent navigation stack. And our multi-robot task allocation system allows robots to communicate with each other and, and use the auction-based system to bid for tasks so that each robot could export different sections of the course without interfering with each other. So Overall, autonomy allowed beyond comms uh, exploration when there's poor or no communication back to the base station. So, and the robots can explore beyond comms, collect object detections, and come back to comms range and send the data back to the base station. Our communication system was based on uh, reagent radios, and we uh, developed a communication framework on top of that for data sharing in a lossy and resource constrained uh, comms environment. So Wildcat Slam is available through Emerson, who licenses this technology from us for, for their hover map, uh, hover map product, and also through Automap, who developed a version of our cat pack under license running Wildcat Slam as well. So more details of our approach can be found uh, in these reference papers. We are also preparing another paper uh, uh, focusing more on our finals effort, but we also have a reference here for uh, our brand new paper on, on Wildcat Slam that was just uploaded to Archive a couple of days ago. And, and of course, we did um, a ton of testing as well, which which um, which helped uh, help with our performance. As you can see in these videos, we weren't uh, necessarily kind to the robots when we were doing testing. Um, so, going to the next slide. Um, now, our lab now has all the commercially available quadruped platforms that were deployed in the Safety Challenge by various teams. So the Ghost Vision 60 platform that was deployed by Team Pluto in earlier stages of the competition, anybody Animal deployed by Team Zebras, and of course the Boston Dynamics Spot deployed by us and, um, and, a, and a number of other teams as Tim mentioned um, earlier. So, um, so we thought of doing something fun for this workshop to compensate for, for us not being there in person. So we wanted to know what would happen if we take the stock standard out of the box configuration of these robots and race them uh, with full sticks forward on flat ground. Um, so uh, this video is extremely fresh, less than less than a day old, uh, and comes with a language warning, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, Team Cerberus members might recognize the voice of Fabio in the background, who is the cameraman. Uh, we have Tom on Animal, Fletcher on Spot, and Ryan on, on, uh, on the Vision 60. So hope you enjoy. Okay, in three, two, one, go! Oh! Oh, look at that! <laughs> All right, so uh, with that, uh, okay. I'd like to um, open the floor for questions. Thank you, Nadine, Navina, for the 
talk. Um, are there any questions from the room? So we have a question from Marco. Thanks, Alina, for the overview. Now, you had a complete set of like bit tracked flying and legged robots. With the state that you have today, you would have to participate again. How would you assemble the team? Uh, that, that, that's an interesting question. So as you saw from that slide, we, we started with, uh, with various different platforms as we found out more about what uh, um, DARPA was uh, kind of setting up uh, that influenced our, our choice of platforms. Uh, initially, we, we did think that this would be an extremely hard um, locomotion challenge. In the initial stages, that wasn't necessarily the case, but then, then we realized this really is an autonomy challenge, not just a locomotion challenge, with, with obviously requirements for perception, navigation, and all of that. And uh, I guess we, we were a little bit fortunate that we had um, kind of the slam part almost solved. So that was one of the least uh, of our worries because it just worked um, since we worked on slam for quite a while. So then it was a matter of finding robots that actually could, uh, could survive the full, full one hour run and also be able to um, navigate the, the challenging terrain. So we started with uh, low clearance track robots in the early stages. We, we started developing our own hexapod robot, um, which was extremely challenging. Uh, halfway through the competition, we realized it was not easy to compete with a completely brand new design robot just for the competition when, when you had the likes of Boston Dynamics who had been in the game for for many decades uh, with, with a lot more funding than us. Uh, but it, it was it was interesting to develop that Hexapod platform. We did deploy it in the, in the tunnel competition. Uh, if we had more resourcing and time, uh, we would have developed it further. And I, I, we still believe that, uh, that a six-legged robot has an advantage over a four-legged robot. But having, having that um, variety really helped us um, because the track robots were seen as uh, the robots that we had, they, they were really capable of going over pretty much any terrain, but they had a larger form factor. Uh, so that's where the spots came in. They were more agile going up and down stairs. They were narrower. And of course, having the drones to be able to reach high alcoves and things like that. So I, I don't think we, we would change that configuration, the, the set of agents that we had in the finals. I think if we had all that knowledge, I think we still would have gone for that sort of a combination. Can you just comment uh, the, the chat because we also have online viewers? Uh, can you repeat that? I, I didn't. I didn't um, can you look at the chat, uh, Zoom chat? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, about spots walking, it looks like spot almost walks with constant pace and get frequency. Uh, so it does have a few modes. Um, what we noticed is when, uh, because we, we are not uh, necessarily um, selecting a gate for that, uh, we, we were uh, sending trajectories um, uh, to the robot. In some cases, we were um, sending waypoints, and usually it's the low level controller that um, selects, the, selects the type of gate uh, that's suitable because it also is using the local sensors to sense the terrain. So we did not. Um, have control over the over the lower level of spots locomotion. I will encourage the last question to be asked through the Zoom chat um, because we have one more uh, talk. Um, so thank you, Navinda, one more time. Thank you very much. <laughs>